All right, thank you, Alice, for the kind introduction and organizing this nice session at AMLD. And I'm pretty excited to be here. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty jet lagged this morning, but being in probably the nicest auditorium I've ever been in is uh, woken me up quite a bit. So today I'm gonna present some results from a survey we conducted uh, a couple years ago to try to better understand how machine learning inference runs at the edge for our over two billion monthly active users. And I think the results paint a pretty vivid picture. And what we found is first, the actual SOCs or the SOC landscape that the mobile app runs on is extremely fragmented. So we're running on over 2,000 unique devices. And the second is that there's actually a huge performance gap in all these different devices. So the performance capabilities of them can vary by over an order of magnitude. And while a lot of these SOCs are now shipping with coprocessors, things like mobile GPUs, they may not always be a viable solution. And finally, when we compare uh, horizontal and vertically integrated solutions, we find that actually performance consistency can be a significant motivator to go to coprocessors or hardware accelerators. And so today, um, Facebook is using machine learning for a lot of its applications and services. So for example, uh, when we rank our posts for news feed, feed and service ads, those are all driven by neural recommendation models. We do a lot of image processing, things like segmentation, detection, and classification that are mostly using CNNs. And we also support translations. So posts that users make in one language can automatically be translated to another of an, that other user's preference. And the sort of model diversity, as well as just sheer volume of requests that come in for inferences and training, pose a lot of really hard and exciting systems challenges that span the compute stack and concern the data center as well as edge devices. And you know, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on inference at the edge. Um, we also have a lot of work on the data center. So we had an HPCA paper in 2018 that sort of described how machine learning runs in the data center. And we also have an upcoming 2020 HPCA paper that tells the story of neural recommendations and the systems that support it. But today I'll just focus on inference on the edge. And the workflow that we use is, I guess, pretty standard at this point. So we start in the data center, we train our models until they've converged and have an accuracy that is okay with us. We then send those trains weights to the edge devices where they can be used to continually make inferences on new unclassified data. And there's a lot of benefits to processing inference on the edge. First is that we can minimize the client's bandwidth uses. So every bit doesn't have to go back and forth between the client and the cloud whenever you wanna make an inference. And the second is that we can actually also improve latency. So it turns out that the round trip time from going from the client to the cloud back to the client can be extreme and it can sort of outweigh the benefits that you would get from leveraging the more powerful server in the cloud. So we just run them locally. And finally, I don't think anyone's mentioned this one previously in this session at least, but running inferences at the edge actually provides us access to a richer, higher bandwidth set of data and allows us to improve user experience and do things that we couldn't do before. So one example of this is the AR features on uh, Facebook Live are actually doing some key point detection directly on the edge because they need to process on a really fast video stream. And as you might imagine, trying to process these really complex models on these constrained edge devices pose a lot of challenges. And on one hand, if you look at what's going on, right, every year uh, companies that manufacture these SOCs are building more and more performant systems. So the theoretical performance of SOCs is steadily increasing. But if you take a more holistic view of the ecosystem, um, there's actually significant performance variation from, say, the latest iPhone to even just the mean phone that people are running on. So if we look at this plot here, we have phone release year on the x-axis and theoretical CPU performance on the y-axis. And the size of each of these circles uh, represents the fraction of Facebook mobile app users using each device. 
And what we're seeing here is that while there are a lot of high performance phones out there, there's also a lot of phones that have like an order of magnitude less possible performance. So when we want to try to provide the same experience to all users on the app, this can be a challenge because you're not sure what sort of compute capabilities any particular user is going to have. And if we look a little deeper, the edge poses a lot of challenges that just aren't seen at the cloud. And most of this comes in the form of diversity. So some examples of this are we find two major operating systems running on the phones. We have three major graphics or GPU APIs, over 20 major chipset vendors, 20 microarchitectures for the CPU, and 20 major microarchitectures for the GPU. When we put all that together, we find that there's over 2,000 unique SOCs that the Facebook app runs on. This means that doing things like trying to tune the app or customize the app for every SOC to improve performance doesn't really scale, or it's really hard to achieve here. Okay, and now that we've seen sort of how machine learning is used at Facebook and some of the general problems that are facing us, uh, let's dig into some data. And we'll start by taking a deeper look into all the devices that we're running on. So to understand the mobile landscape, we'll start by taking a deeper look into this fragmentation problem and the hardware that the app is running on today. Then we'll look at the performance gaps, or lack thereof, of coprocessors on mobile SOCs. So we'll compare the theoretical performance of mobile GPUs to that of the CPU clusters. And finally, we'll talk about some of the other problems facing using coprocessors, which is just mapping work there on the first place, or programmability. So this is the CDF of all the SOCs that we found the app running on, and the CDF on the y-axis. And if you look at this for a second, you might say, well, sure, there's 2,000 plus unique SOCs, but there's a pretty long tail here, right? So can't we just optimize for the common case? Um, that would be really nice, but the data doesn't really support it. So let's say that it was possible for us to build 50 different versions of the app, optimized for 50 different SOCs. Well, if we did that and deployed it, that would only cover 65% of our users. And if we wanted to get up to you know, something like a common case, say like 95% of our users, we'd have to have 225 unique versions of the app. And sort of the, the takeaway that I see with this data is that, you know, there's no standard SOC. I feel like um, whatever phone we tend to have, we think that's sort of what everyone has, but um, that's not really true here. And it's really hard to optimize your software for so many different devices and have it run um, reliably. So if we take a deeper look into this um, and look within those SOCs, uh, we see a different story sort of gets told here. So the, we're looking at the CPU cores, the general purpose CPU cores that the app's gonna run on across all the SOCs. And the first thing that really stands out is that in 2018, the last time we pulled all this data, 28% uh, of the SOCs were using CPUs designed in 2013 or later. That means that 72% of the smartphones running Facebooks were using CPUs that are more than seven years old. So that was pretty surprising to me. Um, another thing we found was that uh, the ARM Cortex-A53 was the, by far, um, most common core in 55% of all the devices. And so while the CPUs show far less diversity, there's only really a, a, a handful, like dozens of different ones out there, um, a lot of this technology is quite dated, and the latest and greatest cores that always get announced by companies like Apple are only being used in a very select set of phones and SOCs. So one way to sort of improve performance or inference capabilities at the edge for all users would be to consider something like a coprocessor. So in this case, that would be like a mobile GPU, which we've seen is becoming more and more prevalent um, almost across the board. Um, the problem here is that if you look at all the different CPUs, so we have uh, SOCs, sorry, uh, if we look at those, the market share on the x-axis, and then the y-axis, which is the theoretical GPU flops divided by the theoretical CPU flops for each of those CPUs, so that means that uh, the higher up on the y-axis you are, the more performant your GPU is gonna be relative to your CPU. 
um, we see, at least to me, what was some pretty surprising data, and that's that uh, the, the most SOCs have a GPU that is only as performant as a CPU. So even if we were to offload the inference to the GPU, we wouldn't actually realize any performance benefits, and in fact, we'd actually probably get a performance loss because the time it takes to go back and forth from the CPU to the GPU. And if we want to actually look at phones or SOCs that have meaningful performance improvement, something like a 3x GPU benefit over the CPU cluster, uh, that's only going to be available in 15% of SOCs. And those SOCs that have the high-powered GPUs also tend to have high-power CPUs, so they can usually handle the mobile inference workload anyway. So finally, uh, look at a sort of a, a different problem facing using mobile coprocessors and GPUs, and that's programmability. So like I said, like today, sure, most GPUs or say coprocessors don't offer that much raw performance benefit over a CPU, but we could imagine things coming down the line that achieve 10 or 100x uh, CPU. But I, I still think we're gonna have a really hard time adapting them in like the Facebook use case where you have horizontal integration. Um, and that's because these APIs to access accelerators, especially GPUs, are pretty flaky. So we looked at OpenCL, OpenGSEL, and Vulkan for Android GPUs. And perhaps the most alarming data, or surprising, I guess, data comes from OpenCL. So we had a bunch of engineers that were experimenting running Facebook's mobile inferences with OpenCL, and what they found is that 1% of the time they tried to run an inference on the mobile GPU, it crashed the app. So at scale, that's sort of just unacceptable and a non-starter. Um, OpenGL ES does a lot better, and I'm told that everything in OpenGL 3.1 and above it makes it practically feasible to run uh, neural inferences on the GPU. Uh, but there's two problems. One, the adoption's been relatively low, so we've just crossed 50%. And the other one is we're starting to see a lot of different versions of this API getting pushed. Um, and of course, that just makes things a little trickier. Vulkan is a promising replacement. Uh, the problem that you can probably see from this pie chart is that there's very little adoption. So it's still pretty young, and I think it's only available on something like 36% of the Android phones we saw. So we have a problem here. Um, a lot of that's because of software and not being able to even map work onto GPUs in the first place. So the state of the art for mobile inference, at least at Facebook, is CPUs. So all of our Machine learning that runs on the edge for Android device, for all of these reasons, is actually running on CPU clusters. Okay, so now that we've seen how, this is like a horizontally integrated solution, right? You have an app developer that's gonna ship their app to a bunch of uh, CPUs and SOCs. But now we can look at a different form of edge, which is a vertically integrated solution with uh, Oculus VR, which is also being developed at Facebook. So for Oculus, we actually use machine learning for quite a few things, like uh, image processing as well as tracking, like hand and key point tracking. And the challenge with Oculus, or I guess just VR in general, is that you need really high uh, throughput or performance. So typically the workloads call for at least 30, but probably closer to 60 FPS. And if you think about those, um, image workloads that we talked about on the mobile app, those tend to be on the order of 10 FPS. So you need at least three, but probably six X more performance for VR. And so to understand the benefits of coprocessors in a vertically integrated solution, we're gonna compare running ML inferences on a cluster of CPUs, the ARMS A73s, to a DSP, which is the Hexagon 620. And we'll consider a variety of different benchmarks. So we have five here, and they span different compute and uh, memory footprint or model sizes. Uh, and you can see the relative numbers here. So when we run all these, uh, we somewhat probably unsurprisingly find that the DSP consistently outperforms the CPU. But if we dig a bit deeper, we find that uh, a lot of the big benefits come from models that use more, I would say, like classic uh, CNNs, things that are passing square filters strided over images. Uh, you get about 3x in the best case. But 
when we use other models for other tasks, um, they tend to be more memory bound, things like depth wise separable convolutions, then the benefits are significantly less. So you're only getting about 20% here. And we, we find an average speed up of about 2x. And sort of one of the other takeaways I see in this is that, you know, even with the DSP solution, when we are able to get it work, we're still talking on the order of 2x, not on the order of like 10 or 100x, which a lot of um, academics have been reporting recently. So that was pretty interesting. But another reason to go to an accelerator isn't just performance. And that's what I'm gonna show here. So what we did was we took one of those models from the first one and just kept running it over and over and over again, either on the CPU or the DSP to sort of get it in the steady state. So the x-axis here is time and we're just running inferences continually. And if we look at this first plot, the FPS, we can see that at the beginning, it looks like what we saw on the previous slide. The DSP is getting about 2x speed up, um, clocking in at like 20 FPS. And if we look at the power, the middle chart there, we can see that the CPU is also consistently dissipating more power than the DSP, um, and something funny is going on. So then what's actually happening here is if you plot the temperature of these two devices over time, you can see the upper line, the light blue one there, that's the CPU temperature. So it's actually going up quite rapidly until it hits about um, 50 degrees Celsius, at which point the thermal throttling kicks in. So that means the chip's gotten too hot and it's gonna drop the frequency. So you can see the corresponding dip in FPS as well as power. And then in the temperature, we dip down and as the chip reaches sufficiently cool, I guess, it kicks the frequency back up. It very quickly hits the thermal throttling point again, and then it has to drop down for a really long time. And you can see these sort of spikes in the FPS and power, and you can imagine that if you have a VR headset on, um, that's not the sort of user experience you wanna provide, consistently switching back and forth between high FPS and low FPS somewhat unexpectedly. And so when we think about accelerators, it's not just about high performance, it's also about low steady power draw, which allows a reliable, consistent performance level for a superior uh, user experience. And with that, you know, it, it sort of made us think like, well, if this is happening in vertically integrated solutions, maybe it's also happening in the horizontally integrated solutions as well. So we went back to look at the workloads running across mobile SOCs to see if we had performance vary, if we could observe performance variation there as well. And it turns out that we could. Uh, we actually found quite a bit of it. So this is one of the most uh, commonly run CNN layers of a prominent model shipped to all devices, um, running on the Apple A11 chip. Um, and it's the exact same model layer running on the exact same device, just collecting a histogram of all the model times. And you can see that it can vary quite a bit. Uh, 70 to 75% of those are in the one to three uh, inference time range, and then there's a very long tail um, where bad things can happen. And the, the, the challenge here is that, you know, it, it's actually really hard to observe this behavior uh, anywhere aside from production. So we tried to replicate it in a controlled environment, even with the Android OS, or uh, we tried to replicate it on Android and iOS. Uh, we couldn't get it to be either, so we think it's some function of a uh, higher level, like context switching or a user running a bunch of different apps. But th the problem is that if you're performing optimizations in a controlled environment where you don't assume this distribution, you can actually propose optimizations that when you consider variation, end up being net negative. So you'll actually, on average, consume more energy than before the optimization. So what we wanna do is try to model these variations we see in production and ship them to the academic community to allow others to do sort of more, um, or just research that's more indicative of the real world so we can more readily adapt those solutions. And this is sort of a call to action. Uh, we have some ideas for how to model these distributions. They are basically approximate Gaussians and some work has been done on this already, but we need new metrics for fair uh, rigorous evaluation, but also not being too hard such that an academic team uh, couldn't evaluate it. And with that, I will conclude. Uh, this is the name of the paper, and I'd like to thank all of our very many co-authors for the really hard work that they did to get these systems up and running, as well as just collect this data. Um, thank you all for coming to the talk, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you, Brendan. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you have two microphones here and there, so just step up and, uh, and ask it. Well, I, I have a question. <laughs> um, what do you think are the major differences between mobile and data center machine learning? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, most of, or at least a significant portion of the ML models that we've run on the edge are CNNs. Uh, but in the data center, we run almost no CNNs. So if you look at a paper we posted on an archive a couple of years ago, only 4% of the deep learning cycles in Facebook's data centers go to CNNs. Um, the other fraction of that is all fully connected and something that's called sparse length sum. And the reason for that is that most of the DNN workloads that we run in the data center are for recommendation models. And those look very different uh, from CNNs. And they propose or they present a lot of really hard systems challenges because you basically have this massive embedding table and a bunch of sparse irregular lookups into it. Um, this embedding table doesn't fit on chip, so you have to go to DRAM. And there's almost no locality. So once you've brought in these very few um, words from DRAM, you're also getting like no reuse out of it. So um, we really need to think about how we design systems for these irregular deep learning models that eat up a lot of cycles in the data center. I also have a question regarding the, the cloud. <laughs> so sorry for, for that, but it's uh, uh, I would like to know on, at Facebook uh, how much uh, of the energy of your data center is spent to do uh, machine learning, is that something public or? Uh, I don't think that one's public, no. <laughs> we do care a lot about energy efficiency and have a lot of people um, working on more efficient machine learning. We take it pretty seriously. So how you design um, Facebook applications so that it works well in high-end phones that optimizes the performance and it's still decent performance in the low-end phones? Uh, so we've invested quite a bit of research and development in the uh, back ends for these mobile devices and that helps quite a bit. So I think a lot of the engineers have a rough understanding of when a model is just not going to run in real time on mobile. So we sort of have a threshold there. But we also have things like um, NNPack, which can do some basic um, compiler-like transformations to sort of automate the adaption of those operators and lower them down effectively onto any cluster. Um, so quantization using Winograd, trying FFTs, um, how you fuse layers together, all those sorts of things. Um, that's been sort of our biggest, I think, win uh, to combat the diversity in performance. Okay, thank you, Brendan. Thanks.